Okay, so we are back. Yeah, thank you for joining us again. For those who will join us later, who kind of slept uh, until 11 o'clock, thank you for joining us uh, through our online service. And, uh, and uh, we just pray that God is going to bless you through this message this morning. And later on, you can actually watch it. If you've missed the service, if you missed the worship time, you can uh, watch it later after the service. Yes? Amen? Amen. Okay, today's message is a very simple one, but very, 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 uh, the disc is scratched, very, 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 very important. Yeah, it's very important as we move forward as a church. Now, there are some, there are some paintings that kind of I like, I like the most, you know, and, and I wish to, to have them uh, somehow in... Uh, if not in 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 in, uh, in a home, not is laughing. I have no idea why he's laughing, uh, uh, but I would like to have and and some of them I like like this one for example, uh, the Rembrandt, the Storm on the Sea from Rembrandt. This is a very powerful uh, powerful painting that uh, um, well you know think about it yeah it's a couple of millions of pounds. Just not just uh, you know anyway. Uh, I like the the Prodigal Son, which which I have I have in my home. It's very powerful. I like the, the Transfiguration by, by Louis Bowen. Um, next, please. Yes, the Transfiguration is very... When you look at, the, at this picture, it just gives you uh, uh, the feeling like the presence of God just invades, you, invades your heart, invades your, your life. But the, and, and then I, have, I like the, the Apostle Paul by Rembrandt. I like, I like the image, the way he sits and thinks and... Is thinking, Lord, I need to write this letter to these guys from Corinth who are fighting, and I have no idea what to tell them. But you inspire me, so it's very, it's very good. But the, this one is the, the one of my favorite pa painting. This one is the one of my favorite, the Tower of Babel. Actually, my mother-in-law um, uh, painted one for me, so she can't hear. But it got destroyed. <laughs> it got destroyed when we moved, kind of. But she painted one for me. It was very, I, I really, I really love that painting. Uh, and uh, if any, any painters in here, take notes. Yeah, I love this. I love this, the, this, this, this image, uh, the, this picture that is, is reminding me that what can happen when people are united. This powerful thing happens when people are united. And I love the story of Tower of Babel because it's, it's kind of vivid. Uh, and we can just easily imagine the, the enthusiastic spirit of the community as they, as they work together to build something. And, and, and now, uh, uh, starting today, uh, a, a small, a very short a new series of sermons called The Power of One. The Power of One. Something happened, something powerful happened when actually people decide to to work together, to put their brains in, in one place, to work together for a project, for something. There is power in one. And I want us today to read the, the story of Tower of Babel, which is in Genesis chapter 11. So open your Bible in Genesis chapter 11. This is the first book in the, in the Bible for those who maybe are not a churchgoer or not a Bible reader. It's the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 11. When you are there, say I. <coughs> yeah, Genesis 11. And it says like this. I'm reading from your living translation. So you have the words on the screen. But feel free to read your own Bible and make notes uh, as God is speaking you through his word. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land. They found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower of people were building. Look, he said, the people are united. <clears throat> the, 
the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. I want you to underline that verse. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down. When it says, come, let's go down, it's talking, God is talking to himself, talking to the Trinity. Yeah? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. This is the, the Trinity in place. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. That is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. Wow. Wow. Now, how many of you heard about the, the law of synergism? Have you heard about that? No? Give it for free. Again, if you come to church, give it for free. All free. Yeah? And the law, the, this law states that when the joint action of agents are brought together, they increase each other's effectiveness. Yeah? I'll repeat again. When the joint actions of agents are brought together, they increase each other's effectiveness. And you know what? The, the world has used this law of synergism more than, than we, the believers. And, and it's, kind of, it's kind of sad. And, and we find a story in the Bible that actually illustrates this fact, this law of synergism. The, the Tower of Babel, the story of the Tower of Babel. The, the people in Babylonia be, be, began to, to work together and, and they accomplished an enormous idea. The building of the Tower of Babel. Now, although their hearts were wrong, but they were at least unified. And what did God say concerning the power of their unity? And it says, nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Because God knew when they are united, this law of synergism, it will be much more effective. And nothing will stop them from doing something. The people were unified. They spoke the same language as the Bible. They used the same words. They were unified in destinations. They, they were unified in deciding a place to settle down. They were unified in building a great city with, with, the, with the tower reaching into the sky. They were unified with staying as one in one place. And their goal was to reach the tower that reaches, to build the tower that, that reaches all the way to heaven. With the motivation to make a name for themselves. With the motivation for them to be famous. And here is the principle actually behind all of this. As one, as one, there is nothing they cannot do. They were using these principles for, for the wrong purposes. But there is a power of oneness. They make things happen. If you are unified for evil, evil things will happen. If you are unified for, for good, lots of good things will happen. And when you come together in unity, there is a great power. Things happen when people come together. And in our text says that, that they wanted to build something for them. And God said, I'm going down to divide them. Now the question is, why is God saying, I'm going down to divide them. I mean, isn't our God a God that unites people? Right? I mean, is it supposed to be Satan's job to divide people? So why God says, I'm going down to divide them? You know why? Because Satan divides people when, when they accomplish something good. But God divides people when they try to accomplish something evil. And I will prove you today to this message. Because there is power in one. There is power in one. God built this world. How? Starting with what? One man. Adam. What the Bible says further? That God blessed the whole nations through the obedience of who? One man. Abraham. God set his people free from slavery through one man, 
Who? Moses. 5,000 people, says in the New Testament, were fed because of one boy with a happy meal. God saves the world, the entire world, through what? Through one man, Jesus Christ. There is power in one. And now, number one in the Bible represents unity. When we talk about one, it's always about unity. But number one, mathematical terms, in the mathematics says that number one can only be divided by itself. Yeah? Now, all the who knows mathematics, they will say amen to that. Yes? Amen? The other numbers can be divided by itself and other smaller numbers, like 4 divided by 2, 4 divided by 3, 3 divided by 2, two and so on. But number 1 is the only number that can be divided by itself. In other words, the only person that can divide you is you. When you, when, when you say, how is that possible? I, I, I don't think so, Pastor. I mean, you don't know my life. You don't know my past. You know, if, if it wasn't for, for the way I was raised, it, it, it would be probably a different way. If it wasn't for, for those circumstances, maybe I could be different today. You blame someone from your past for who you are today, for the decision you made to be today. The, what you became today, what you become today is because you blame on somebody from your past. The hurt, the influence, the drama in your past, you blame them and you think that they are responsible for your life. Because that's probably you learn in school from Freud, right? The big guy Freud, this is what he's telling you, he's telling you. But one can be divided by its only divided by itself. In other words, you decide if you let the circumstances from your past to decide for your life. You decide the circumstance and the people from your past to affect your life. They cannot divide you only if you let them do it. And the church, if you look out to the whole history of the church, the church is never, was never and is never divided by outside. Never divided by outside. In the whole history, the whole division came from the inside, not from the outside. Yes, there was a scattering away for the, for the Christians and kind of uh, uh, trials to stop the existence of the church. And yes, it was persecution. But actually, the persecution of the church, they brought more unity in the church than actually division. So when we begin to, to divide by, uh, by, by the inside, the progress of, of moving forward stops. The growth stop, stops. The, and the enemy has won. Now, psychology teaches us that each individual is formed by two. You are two. What I mean by that is there's always two of you. The one is the, the ideal you that you present outside. Everyone sees you, everyone's kind of, this is the perfect you. The ideal that you kind of desire people to see you. And then there's the second person who is the inside of you that nobody wants, that you don't want, nobody wants to, to, to know about and to show it to the outsiders. And one of these two will create division. The one can be divided by itself. Why? Because there are two of you fighting all the time. Now, I don't have to read psychologies to, to tell me that. The Bible actually it is telling me that, that we are, we, we are an image and we have also an insight. Look what Matthew chapter 23, verse 28 says. In the same way, on the outside, everybody says outside. On the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the, what? On the inside, everybody said inside. On the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. And, and, and when you see people doing, doing kind of bad things, you are kind of a bit, a bit shocked and say, what happened? I mean, he was such a great boy. 
she was such a good girl. I mean, this man was, was an example man. What happened? What, what happened here? Why did they do that? It's because there was something wrong inside. What I say about the Tower of Babel? The division came because there was something wrong on the inside. In their hearts, in their motivation. Wrong inside, wrong motivation led them to the outside division. The division of the church, it's made visible outside because something is wrong inside. Mark chapter 3 verse 24 and 25 says like this. If a kingdom is divided against it, what? itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a, if a house is divided against what? Itself, that house cannot stand. If a person is divided against itself, he cannot stand. If a church is divided against itself, the church cannot stand. James, James chapter 1 verse 6 says, But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is what? Is double-minded. It's two of them. It's double-minded and unstable in all they do. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says like this. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18 verse 19. I tell you that if, if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for it will be done for you by my father in heaven for where, the, where where two or three come together in my name there i am with them now we we kind of take that the last part of the the verse 20 and always use it as like for where two or three in my name are gathered there i am with them and that we love that part very much kind of you know we are here two or three it doesn't matter but jesus is here and we forget the first part because if there is no fulfillment of the first part it doesn't happen the last part when i say the first part if to agree about anything then jesus says if you are agreeing with me if you agree together and in unity in my name then i am there we can't say no, we gather together two or three and Jesus is there. You can't expect Jesus to show up in a place where there is a there's a division. You can't expect Jesus to come to be in a place where there is no agreement. Agreeing together, that's what makes Jesus being part of the unity. When two or more people come into agreement, Jesus himself promises to be with them and his presence exerts more power than we can ever imagine in our lives and in our circumstances. So what are the, the consequences of unity? Why do we speak about the power of one? Last week, we, we entered into the, a new season as a church. We started chapter 2 of the life of the church. We cannot write history, we cannot write chapter 2 if there is no agreement together, if there is no unity together, if there is no one together. And there are some consequences of unity. Because the moment we lose sight on the purpose that God has for, for His church, we will begin to turn on each other. The moment the church loses sight of the, of the kingdom's value, then the division will begin to creep into the church. And the enemy knows that because knows he knows that there is power in unity. And that's why he's the master of the division. So I have three points for you today. Three important consequences of unity. Number one. Unity makes the church. Look 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. It appealed to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in what? In harmony with each other. Let there be no division in the church, rather be one mind, united in thought and what? And purpose. 
Now, there are, there are two there are two types of unity in the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says that, that we are to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit to the bond of peace. Make every effort, not some effort. People say kind of make an effort and say, well, I make all the effort. It says make, make all the effort to keep the, what? the unity of the Spirit. So we have one type of unity, the unity of the Spirit to the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit is, 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 is already the fact that for, for, for believers that we must kind of work hard to keep that unity. The unity in the church does not just, just happen. It doesn't just, you know, when you come together and say, whoa, here it is. It's, it's like, a, like a natural formula. It happens as, as the body of Christ makes every effort to pursue unity. Then in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13, there's a second type of unity after about the ministry of pastors and, and teachers who kind of says in verse 12 to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Paul says, until we all reach unity in the faith, unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This unity of faith is, is, is not yet a reality, but is attained as we grow to maturity in Christ. Unity is expressed by believers' common purpose. You know, if you look about marriage, marriage doesn't survive based upon whether we, we share all of the same interest. It doesn't survive. Some people might say you have to have all in common, you know, and then you're going to be successful. But marriage doesn't survive based upon whether we share all the same interests. Marriage survives because two people stay together over the things that matter. The things that matter, we will, they say the things that matter for us, we will stay united. The other one is not a big deal. I mean, if he, if he likes golf and she likes to cook, who cares, right? Good advice, make a good food. By the time he comes from golf, you have a deal. Unity will stop the progress because nothing grows in this unity. Nothing grows in this unity. And the body of Christ divides when they start focusing on preferences more than purpose. And I want to repeat that. The body of Christ, the church, divides when they start focusing on their personal preferences more than God's purpose. You know what a divider is? A divider are... The dividers are the, are the people on a mission to get everyone... To conform to them instead of them to be conformed to the group and that's a divider unity is the one that makes the church not this unity because nothing grows in this unity so unity number one makes the church the church is one body united to exist together for the same purpose for God's purpose number two unity brings the blessing of God. Psalm 133 says like this. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in what? In this unity. Right? Amen? What do you say amen? I said in this unity. You have said no pastor in unity. How good and pleasant is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured out on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on the Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, every, even life forevermore. Now this word together in the Hebrew, again, free lessons, Hebrew lessons, yeah, my wife started to learn Greek, so I'm teaching now Hebrew. The Hebrew word for together is the word yakdao, and it means all alike, equally, all at once. 
all at once. And the word together, it appears 92 times in the Old Testament, and it simply implies a community of people in action. All together in action. And the word oil in the Hebrew is semen, and it means fat. Simple, fat. Yeah? But it implies a picture of richness and strength and being fertile. Because God pours out his richness and his strength and gives us fertile ground when we are united, when we are together. The blessings that they, they, they experience is, is, is compared to the precious anointing oil that is poured upon Aaron's head and then that flows down all the way to the, to the bottom and his whole body is covered with it. It was compared to the, the refreshing dew that, that would flow down from the mountains and bring refreshing life to those in the valley below. Moving together as a church, one common purpose and one common uh, 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 impulse brings the anointing, brings the refreshing, brings the blessing of God upon us and upon the people around us. When we, when we come together and when we, we in unity, is, is where, where to, to see the manifestation and the demonstration of the power of God's blessing in our lives. Can you imagine what would happen if the entire congregation of believers would come to church with one common purpose, with one common passion, with one common longing, with one common expectations and hungering to be together in the presence of God? Can you imagine that? So unity brings the blessings of God. And number three, unity brings the power of God. The power of God. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Unity brings the power of God. Acts chapter 2 says like this. Now, when we read Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> how many you think about all the time fellowship, sharing? Wow, they all f they had fellowship there around God's word and, and, and they shared all this together. We all know that, right? But Acts chapter one, 2 verse, verse 1 says like this. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together, together, in what? In one place. Suddenly there was a sound... There was a sound from heaven like the roaring of mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looks like flames of tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. It says here the people were one in one place. They, they, they were in one in one place. There are people in the church who always kind of say, I want to see the power of God. I want to see miracles happening just like happened in, in the book of Acts. We want to see a revival, a real revival in our church coming to us. But they forget to say, in order for this to happen, we need to get together in one place for one purpose. When we are united in our goal for the kingdom, there is a power of God that comes upon you. But when we gather to debate the personal preferences, there will be no blessings. And in Acts chapter 4, the other, the other part, when we kind of think about fellowship and sharing, and it says like this. Acts chapter 4 verse 31, it says like this. After the, this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they preached the word of God with boldness. All the believers were what? United in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. And the apostle testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. The release of the, of, of the true Holy Spirit power, it was, it was directly related to the unity of the believers. One of the reasons why the early church was, was so affected because, because they were united in one purpose, in one goal. 
And there is nothing, there is nothing powerful that will, that will happen. There, there's something powerful that will happen when, when the body of Christ is united together in one accord. And in John chapter 17, these are the Jesus', Jesus words. And it says like this. John 17. John 17 says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will be able, they, they will all be what? One. Just as you are, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that they, the world will believe you that you sent me. In this text it says that Jesus prayed for all who could call upon his name to be one. And then the world will watch and they will be drawn to Jesus Christ because of that oneness. He didn't say the world is going to be drawn to me because of the great preaching at KEC. He didn't say that the world will be drawn to me because of the great singing at KEC. He said in fact, I am praying that there will be one as the Heavenly Father and I are one. And that unity, that unity, that oneness will draw them to the gospel. Amen? So in conclusion, the power of one. We are moving forward. We are moving forward as one. The story of the Tower of Babel would seem to kind of tell us that God does not want us to be united. But that's not the case at all. Rather by confusing the people and causing them to scatter, God is seeking to promote the right kind of unity. With the right motivation, with the right purpose, with the right heart. We are united as the body when we live together without conflict or oppression and when we have common goals in the line with God's purpose for the world. And this is why Jesus came to unite us. And to point us to God and God's will for this world. And Jesus came to show us that, that, that though we are different, we have common message to share God's love to this world. The mistake of the people in Babel was that they were concerned only about their community and about their own tower and their own city and their own name. Right unity is the most powerful tool we could use to bring the world to Christ and to show the love of God to their lives. Last week we started this new season, chapter 2. And in October, we said last week in October the 10th, you will have an opportunity to come and to see the future. The future belongs to those who are united to fulfilling God's purpose. And you have a choice. Either you stay away and then mumbling and complaining and criticizing as much as you want. Or either you said, I'm joining, I'm all in, joining and embracing the future. Be excited and joining God's vision for his kingdom. Progress stops when division occurs. And the beginning of any success comes back to our level of unity. You have a decision to make today. Will you decide? Will you decide that, 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 that you have now, what you have now, it's, it's, it's good enough? Or will you keep on dreaming with us for the future? The church, this church, is a church of opportunities. Your relationship with God is, is going to grow and to grow and to grow. But only if you decide today to say, yes, I am in whatever comes into my path. Whatever I like it or not, but knowing it's kingdom focus, then yes. We don't want you to stay where you are. We want you to, to be united with us in the same goal, the same purpose. But it's costly. It's costly. Somebody said, good is the enemy of the best. Good is the enemy of the best. And Thomas Jefferson said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. What I want for you is to, to
to celebrate the past. Honor the past. Celebrate the past. I want you to connect with your presence. And I want you to create the future. Celebrate the past. Connect with the present. And create the future. Amen? I also have a message. For those who maybe are watching online. But also maybe here in this room. Who kind of. They don't have, you don't have a relationship with Christ. You, don't, you are not a church girl. You are not, a, you are not a, a Bible interested person. But maybe you are, you are seeking an answer for your faith. My message for you is stop being two. Stop having double minded. You want Jesus. But also you want to live without any accountability. There are people out there who say, I want to be set free, but I can enjoy being addicted. How long would you waver between these two opinions? You have to make a choice. You cannot live in two different worlds. When you are outside, when your outside image comes united with your inside reality, the Bible says that you become one. You are a whole. And the only person that can make you whole, that's Jesus. And Acts chapter 9, 9 verse 34 says that Jesus Christ makes you whole. You are, you are limited in life by your, by your, by your own individual this division. Nobody is dividing you. But you, because you have a choice. If you grab the cross, if you, if you grab Jesus, if you touch Jesus... He will make you whole. He will make you united. Because there are two people inside of you. And one is in trouble. If you solve that one. The other one will be fine. Jesus died on the cross. Not for one of you. But Jesus died on the cross for all of you. For you as a whole. And Jesus said yes. If you believe me. If you touch me, if you accept me, I can make you whole. I can fix what is broken. I can, I, can, uh, I can fix what's wrong with you. And I can make you whole. Amen? Amen. I want to invite the worship team to come here and get ready for, for closing. And I also want to give you a chance to, to respond to the message. You have a choice to make. Either you're part of a church, or either you're watching online maybe this message, and, and you're not, nothing to do with Christianity, nothing to do with Jesus, but you have a choice. You have a choice to make. We are, as a church, moving towards God's purpose, God's vision. And God is calling us to be united in this. God is calling you to seek his kingdom. So I want you to bow down your heads, close your eyes. And um, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me personally to this message? Jesus, what are you saying to me to this message? Is it something that I need to do right now? Is there any step I need to do right now? Is there any decision I have to do right now? Close your eyes, your heads down. This is between you and God. And ask it, what do I need to do? Lord, I'm praying and I thank you that, that you challenge us again and again and remind us that there is power in unity. There is power when, when the right unity comes together. When, when the body of Christ comes together for the right motives, the right reasons, the right purpose. There is power. There is blessing. It comes from you upon us. And we are united. The church is united because of Christ. So we thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, for this church that will continuously be united in one purpose. <coughs> don't put our, we don't want to put our personal preferences above your own purpose. 
So help us, help us to stay united in one purpose, in one goal, because there is power when your people come together for the right reasons. So I pray for this church. Lord, bless us as we move forward. Bless our leadership. Bless our church. Bless our bless us as, as we go out and, and be in church in the world. So they can see the, 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 the unity of your church and they'll be drawn to the gospel. Thank you that you prayed for us to be one, just as you are one in Trinity. And we want to be one. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.